Welcome to Candid Conversation. This is the 16th message on beginning Christian. And the last couple of messages, two times ago, talked about that the moment you recognize your sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, you receive the gift of eternal life. And God takes you out of Adam, he places you into Christ. So you were dead in your trespasses and sins, now you are alive in Christ. <coughs> in John 10, 10, Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The moment you believe the gospel, you are given your eternal life. You, you already can live it out. You've given the abundant life of God. And what that means is that now you have the capacity to live by God's Spirit and by God's Word because God is a spirit. His Word is spiritual. John 6, 63, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So the way you live your eternal life isn't by going and helping out at a homeless shelter or feeding at the poor at a soup kitchen. Although that, I mean, it can include that. It's living by the Word of God. Jesus says, uh, Man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth he live. And so we are to live by the very words on the pages of God's Word. And it, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And the words that Jesus has spoken unto us today are found in Paul's epistles. They're not the red letters. Jesus spoke the red letters, but he spoke the whole word of the, the Bible because John 1.1 1, 1 says that he is the word. And in Romans 16.25, Paul says that he is giving the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. 1 Corinthians 14.37, Paul says that the words I speak unto you are the commandments of the Lord. We need to understand that we are to live by the words that Jesus speaks unto us. They're the ones that are spirit. They're the ones that are life. So to live out your abundant, eternal life now, you have to live by the words that Jesus Christ has spoken unto you. And today, since we live in the mystery dispensation, then we live by the words that Jesus has spoken through the Apostle Paul. Because Paul has given the revelation of the mystery, uh, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. The red letters is the preaching of Jesus Christ. The Ten Commandments is the preaching of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is the preaching of Jesus Christ. All of God's Word is the preaching of Jesus Christ. But the words in Paul's epistles are according to the revelation of the mystery. And that's the time we live in now. It's like we don't when the moment that we recognize that we're sinners, we don't all go out and build an ark like Noah did. That was the Word of God. It was spirit and it was life, but it was spirit and life to Noah, not to us. If I build an ark, there's people in that creation museum up in Kentucky. They built an ark, but they didn't get salvation by that. They didn't get eternal life. Noah did, but they didn't because the words of building an ark were the words of spirit and they were alive to Noah, to nobody else. When Jesus spoke in the red letters, those are the words of spirit and life to Israel. Jesus said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24. So Jesus spoke the word, he is the word, he is the Bible. And the Bible is true. And all the Bible is the word of Jesus. Now, I, I understand that some of it, like Job, for example, he's got his three friends there. And Job, his three friends give man's philosophies. And Job is giving religion at times. Not at first, but at the, toward the end he does. That doesn't mean we are to follow what his three friends and what Job says. It's not to say those are the very words of Jesus that he gave to the three friends and to Job. But they are the words of Jesus recorded for you to have, to understand uh, God and his word 
and how he operates in his character and specifically for Israel to understand what will happen in the tribulation period. And you can apply today to look at it and say, well, just because things are going bad for me doesn't mean that I've got some secret sin that I need to confess. Look at Job. You know, Job says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then God says there that in saying that, he did not sin. That was correct. You know, I thought of that verse when my wife went on to be with the Lord. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We trust in the Lord regardless of what happens. But the book of Job was not written to me. It was there and it encouraged me during that tough time. But it's not the word of Jesus Christ to me today. Satan, he talks to Eve in Genesis 3. He talks at other times in the Bible. He talks, he uh, possesses Judas Iscariot and Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss, thanks to Satan being within him. I'm sure Satan had a lot of influence on Jesus being uh, crucified too. 1 Corinthians 2 said the princes of this world had the, had the Lord crucified. So Satan and his forces were a part of that. But just because his words in the Bible doesn't mean that Jesus actually uh, those are the very words of Jesus. They, they're the very words, all of God's word, he is the word. And so all of God's word is the words of Jesus. But they may be recording, Jesus may be recording someone else's words to show you life or to show you what sin is or what temptations are or you know what wrong thinking is, as in the case of Job's three friends. So if you, when you're reading God's Word, it's important to understand that if it's, if it's not quoting somebody else, if it's just, and a lot of times that's what it does, is it just gives you the Word. Prophecy will say, thus saith the Lord. Or it could just be like in the book of John. John's writing, and he's recording the very words of Jesus. And then like in John 2, Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. That's the words of Jesus. Now the next verse, John explains it by saying when he said that, he was speaking of the temple of his body. So if you're reading, if you got a red letter edition and you're reading John chapter two, you'll see that uh, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. That is in red because Jesus spoke those words. Then the next verse, where it says he was speaking of the temple of his body, that's in black because Jesus did not physically speak that. And John is the one who wrote it down. But we know from Peter that all, uh, 1 Peter 1, 20 and 21, I think it is, that all scripture, uh, that holy, that, that prophecy came not uh, by men, but uh, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So whenever you've got, like in John 2 there, and John does this several times, he'll add comments. Those are not his own comments. Because John spoke, this John's word, I mean, John is the one who wrote it down, so he spoke it. But it was, he spake as he was moved by the Holy Ghost. So when John writes down, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days, he is quoting Jesus. And then when he says in the next verse that he was referring to the temple of his body, you could say he's quoting the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost had John write those down, and John actually said those things. But the, the word, since it's when, when someone, when an author of the Bible wrote something down and they weren't directly quoting somebody, then that is the Holy Ghost speaking. And it's also them speaking. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's why you'll have in Matthew through Acts, you'll see where it will quote, and it'll say, David said, you know, Jesus said, well, David said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand and make thy, until I make thy foes thy footstool. He says, David said it. But then in another part, you'll have where it'll say, well, the Holy Ghost said this. Or you get a verse that'll say, well, Isaiah saith. And then you get another part where it says, the Holy Ghost saith this. 
so when you have so when you're reading your Bible and it is written by man but men holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost so when you've got God's Word it is synonymous when, when a man is writing that down it's synonymous with the Holy Ghost speaking it's God's words himself speaking there and it's called the Holy Ghost because the Godhead, the way the Godhead works, and maybe I should do a separate video on this, but the Godhead is just like you and that you've got a three-part, you're a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Well, that's how uh, the Godhead is as well. It's spirit, that's the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. It's soul, that's God the Father. And it's body, which is God the Son, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, God the Father is the one who comes up with the Word of God. Jesus Christ, since He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, then you see Jesus Christ as the Word. So He is the Word. He's the fullness of the Word in written form. Just like He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily, He's also, so He's the body of it. So when it comes to God also, He is the Word. The Word is synonymous with God. It's the same level. I mean, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of God is the same as God Himself. Because God the Father is the one who came up with the Word. Proverbs 8 tells us that. He comes up with the Word. Jesus Christ is the Word. Remember, He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when you got the Word of God on the pages of your Bible, that is Jesus right there, Jesus Christ. And then when uh, the Holy Ghost is the one who teaches you God's Word, that's spirit or breath. And that's why Jesus says in John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So the words are breath, the breath of God basically. It's the Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost who teaches you the Word. And then as you apply it, well then you're living out the Christ life. That's why Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So how do you live, how does Christ live in you? I. I'm dead, I'm crucified with Christ, but yet I live, but it's really Christ living. How does that work? Well, it's because Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and He is the fullness of it when it comes to the Word of God, too, because the Word of God is synonymous with Jesus Christ. So when He speaks, so when you got God's Word there, it's really Jesus Christ, and when you let and when you believe those words and you live by it, then you're living by the faith of the Son of God. And so then Christ is living out in you because the Word of God is God. And Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when God's Word is being lived out through you, then that's Christ living right there because He is the Word. That's why you've got godliness. Godliness is God living through you, being like God. And it's Christ living through you as a result of God's Word. So, when you've got your Bible, all of it is God's Word. Now, if Satan says something, or Job says something, or Job's three friends say something, or Saul says something, that doesn't mean that we need to follow exactly what they say because it's in God's Word. But what God is doing is He is accurately recording the events of what those people are saying or doing. They may or may not be right. David, for example, there's a lot of history of David in your Bible. Uh, he did a lot of things he should have done. He uh, had faith in God to kill Goliath. He had faith in God to win a lot of battles against the Philistines. But he didn't have faith in God when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He didn't have faith in God when he murdered Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. So just because it's in the Word of God, it doesn't mean we should do it. We look at it and God has accurately recorded those events. 1 Corinthians 10, it says, these are X samples and they are in samples for us. X sample being external, in sample being internal. 
there are X samples and N samples that we should not lust as they did and follow you know what Israel did in the flesh so that doesn't mean just because it's in the Bible it's holy and we follow it if people did things or people said things and it's recorded this is a quote of those people then um, we have to analyze it in terms of what we know about God's Word. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.7, and this is why it's so important to rightly divide the Word of Truth. He says in 2 Timothy 2.7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So how is it that I know that I should follow the faith of David that he had in killing Goliath, or the faith of David in destroying the Philistines, but yet I don't follow him in adultery and murder? Well, it's because I know from the rest of God's Word that adultery and murder is not of God. If I consider what Paul has said, and I understand the basic foundational doctrine in Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, then I'll have understanding of the entire Bible. And I can look at what somebody says or did and say, well, that's of God, I should do that, or that's not of God, I shouldn't do that. Or that is of God, but yet building an ark is not for me because it's not instructions to me today. So I just see that as an example and show it shows how evil the world became and an example for a type of Enoch being a type of the rapture of the body of Christ and Noah being a type of Israel going through the tribulation period before they're saved. So, um, you know, I can see that, but I, that doesn't mean I'm going to build an ark. So when you look at your Bible, you believe all of it is God's word. Whenever someone is quoted or whenever someone does something, you have to consider it in light of Paul's epistles to figure out, is that something that I should do? Or is it, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, it's an example or an ensample of what I should not do, of what the bad stuff that Israel did there. So I consider what Paul says, then I get understanding. Well, why? Because I the eight verses later in 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I rightly divide the word of truth, understand what's written to me and what's written for my learning. And that's where, that's where we come back, hopefully we've come full circle now to understand about Jesus is the, and understand about Paul's epistles. So if someone is quoted in your Bible, you know, that Satan says this, or Saul says this, or Samuel says this, or David says this, then we know that we have to, you know, we're, in fact, it's just a historical quote. Then we know, well, we got to look at it and see how does that align with the principles that we've learned in Paul's epistles to find out if that's something that we should do or should not do, or if it's just something that was good but only for that particular dispensation and not to us today then if it is written by if it's the very words of Jesus the red letters of course we know that everything that Jesus said and did was good too but that doesn't mean we follow it Jesus says you receive the Holy Spirit by him blowing on you um, that's what he did with the disciples that's not how we receive the Holy Spirit today Jesus says, I give you power to tread on scorpions and to uh, and snakes won't, uh, deadly snakes won't harm you and you can raise the dead and you can drink a deadly thing and it won't hurt you. That's in the red letters. But that's to Israel, it's not to me today. And then if you've got, and this is the majority of the Bible, if it's not Jesus directly speaking, but it's the person who is writing the words of God down and they're not quoting something or sharing an event that happened, then we know that's just as good as the red letters in terms of the authoritative word of God. That is God's word to you today. That's, that's God's, well, not today, but I mean, that's God's word. Uh, it's God's word speaking there. So, For example, over in 1 Samuel 28, Samuel calls, uh, Saul calls up Samuel from the dead. And people say, well, was that really Samuel? Well, yeah, it was. How do I know that? Because it says there that Samuel said this. So that's God speaking, telling me that Samuel said this. So then I know that that is, um, that is God speaking. I, I can believe. Now, if Satan said that it's Samuel, I don't know if that's true or not. But if the text just says Samuel said that, that's the word of God. So then I know that's true.
And that's important to understand because just like I know that 1 Samuel 28, that Saul really did talk to Samuel after he died because it says, and Samuel said. Then I also know when it comes to Paul's epistles, when he's talking, those are the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And I know that those are the words that are written to me. Now, 1 Peter, when he writes down and says, you are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, that's the very words of Jesus Christ given through the apostle Peter. But that's not to me today because I understand that a royal priesthood and a holy nation is Israel. And I understand his audience is Israel. It's not me today. So again, it's Jesus Christ speaking after he had ascended to the Father. He is speaking through the Apostle Peter, but he is speaking to Israel. Whereas Romans through Philemon is Jesus Christ speaking after he ascended to heaven through the Apostle Paul. But he is speaking to me today as a Gentile. And just because it's... Uh, just because Jesus said something in person in Matthew through John doesn't make it any more his word than if he said it from heaven. In fact, if anything, anything he says from heaven is more authoritative because when he ascended to the Father, the Father set him his own right hand far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. He wasn't in, Jesus wasn't in that position when he was on earth. He, when he was on earth, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. And so we understand them, if anything, if you want to say anything's more authoritative, it's not the red letters. It would be whatever Jesus said from heaven, from his position of power, as opposed to being a servant, as being a man. So uh, believe all of God's word is true, all of it is spirit, all of it is life, and um, follow the words that Jesus gives to us today in the revelation of the mystery found in Romans through Philemon. It's not any less authoritative than the red letters. In fact, if anything, it's more authoritative. Of course, it's all really equal because it's all Jesus' words. Uh, but as far as what we are to follow, we follow Romans through Philemon because that is the only part that is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and we are part of that mystery dispensation today. That's why we elevate that above the rest of the Bible because it's written to us today. It's not any more authoritative, it's just to us today, so then we need to follow that. Just like I don't build an ark today, I also don't cast out devils and tread upon scorpions and raise the dead. Um, that was Jesus' words to Israel, not to me today. So I follow Jesus' words to me today found in Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, rather than following Jesus' words in the red letters, which is to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Thanks for watching.